I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. Is AI going to take your job? Another way to put it is, where is everybody? Like, where did all the workers in restaurants go? Where did all the workers in the airplanes go? Like, I just was reading today, JetBlue has to cut down on flights because there aren't enough air traffic controllers. Where did everybody go? Well, I have on the man who has the answer, and it's Matt Barry from Freelancer.com. Things have changed so much since the last time he came on. He came on in 2017, and the world has gone from 3% of people doing freelancing work to upwards of 40% of people doing freelancing work. And now AI, is that going to just change everything for the better or for worse? We talk about all these things, talk about the economy, worst case scenarios, best case scenarios, but most of all, it's just fascinating. Is AI going to take your job or anybody else you know? Here's Matt and I talking about it. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Matt, we last spoke six years ago, and I feel like the freelancing world has a billion percent changed. What an incredible I mean, in time the, to the, be alive. I mean, and, and be a freelancer or be an entrepreneur. It's incredible now. I mean, in 2020, I was reading that only 3% of the workforce were freelancers, and now it's up to 40% of the workforce does some sort of freelancing work. What are they all doing? What's happened to the world? I mean, other than the pandemic. Well, I mean, every job in the world now can be done with a computer pretty much from anywhere in the world. Software has, you know, eaten everything. It's all moved into the cloud and uh, human and computer interaction has got so good that, uh, you know, people on the other side of the world can work in a team on pretty much any profession and, you know, in real time. Uh, at the same time, you've got whole huge numbers of people that have gone online uh, around the world in emerging markets as the internet's kind of uh, grown everywhere and getting skilled up, getting trained up. And now with artificial intelligence, Everyone in the world can now perform at the elite level in a whole variety of skills. You can now illustrate at the level of an elite illustrator, even though you might not have any design skills whatsoever. You can write copy. Uh, you, can, you can program using ChatGPT. Um, it's, an, it's just an incredible time. And uh, the, the whole space is moving so quickly with um, you know all the tooling that's now available for freelancers that is all powered by AI. Yeah, and like a lot of people go back and forth on the AI component of this. And I... And I I'm I'm still interested in like in the economics of like why people are leaving the kind of regular workforce for freelancing, but 
a lot of people are worried, will AI take their jobs? So let's say I was going to hire someone to make a logo. Well, now I could just go to Mid Journey or Dolly or any of these AI graphic tools and say, get me a logo. Give me five, give me 5,000 logos I'm going to pick from. And this is what I want. And, and then do it in the style of Salvador Dolly and boom, it does it. Like, is there going to be a human need for many of the typical freelancing jobs? Oh, absolutely, because you still need someone to drive all the tools. My, my, you know, my mother would be completely in, unable to go to Mid Journey and figure out how to how to use it. Um, and also, people are very time poor, so you always need to get people to do things for you. Uh, even if you know how to do the particular work, you've you've got to get people to assist you with that. You know, these tools basically super skill everyone. It lifts it lifts the the ability of everyone um, around the world in in a variety of different categories, and that's going to uh, increase. And the world is desperately short in skilled labor. Uh, all around the world, you know, every female on the planet needs to have 2.1 children to maintain the population. And across the Western world, there are, the birth rate is way below the replacement rate. Even in Bangladesh today, the birth rate is well below the replacement rate. So we're critically short, you know, engineers, critically short computer scientists and programmers. You know, in some countries like Japan, it's so pronounced that in you know, 2011, Unicharm, which is the largest manufacturer of diapers in, in Japan, says we now produce more adult diapers than baby diapers. Right, so so oh there's, a, there's a there's a huge, there's that a huge that is an unbelievable. That's the statistic of the day. <laughs> so there's there's a there's a huge need for skilled talent, and you know, like all technologies in the past, um, you know, technology can be disruptive temporarily, but it does create more jobs in the end than it takes. Although, you know, I will say that the advances that are happening in AI, you know, one week in AI seems to be one year in any other field of field of research. We'll kind of see see where it ends up. But you know, what we're seeing right now is that the, that basically it's giving superpowers to people around the world. No matter what your skill set is, you can now, you know work in all these different areas at the elite level. It's incredible. It reminds me of like in the 90s where people would spend a lot of money hiring others like freelancers to make their websites. But then making websites became ridiculously cheap, at least at the basic level, because you could just use WordPress or something like that. But still probably now more people than ever are hired to build websites because you still need, no matter what, a human component to really manage the process. Like there, there, there's always, it seems like a human component, no matter what the technology is. And that's right. And, and people are very time poor. There's so many things you can do in the world now that you're hyper-connected, right? And there's so many distractions, whether it's, whether it's work yeah. or whether it's Instagram or whether it's, you know, you know, communicating with people or whatever it is, you know, the time is increasingly precious. And so you do need people to help you no matter what it is. And if you look at some of these professions and what's happened over the last decade or two uh, with the internet and, and, and with um, software and so forth, yeah, you know, look at a graphic designer. You know, twenty years ago, graphic designers, their bread and butter, at least, you know, amongst the people I knew that were doing graphic design, was I'll design for you a logo, and you know, I'll do that for a few thousand dollars, and then afterwards, what I'll do is I'll do a stationary set for you with business cards, and that'll be like a little bit more, and you know, it was all kind of that level of, of sort of work. Yeah, you know, over the last decade, graphic designers don't really, in the West, don't really do that anymore. They're up the stack now. They're designing apps. They're designing websites. They're designing businesses, right? They can now hire freelancers who can program to help them kind of turn their dreams into reality. Um, and and with AI, it's going to be another leap again where, you know, the, the AI will probably design the app and the website for you and you'll be more of a conductor or the editor or the producer or the cinematographer saying, I want it to be a little bit different, uh, maybe a bit more color there, uh, add a feature so we can, you know, do the following. And, and you know, the nature of work is going to be more and more higher level and more, more at the, you know, the production level and the directing level than, than maybe on the tools pushing pixels around the screen. And, you know, let, let me ask this. I wonder if this is true for Australia like, and, and around the world. Because, again, freelancer.com is, is a global site. There's about 60 million users. So it's around the world. I wonder if you're seeing the same thing we're seeing very particularly here in the U.S., which is after the pandemic, it seemed like nobody went back to work. Like every restaurant was complaining to me, oh, we don't have anybody. None of our old employees came back. Where did everybody go? Did they all go to freelancer.com? No, I mean, that's, a lot of them did, yeah, actually, yes. Uh, so th there's been three major um, points in the world in the last um, decade where you've had this discontinuity of disruption that's, that's occurred in the marketplace for work. We saw it in the, originally in the global financial crisis where, you know, even though that was mainly uh, in the US for the most part, you had three things happening. You had businesses going online uh, looking to do things cheaper because it obviously, you know, all the layoffs and everyone was trying to cut costs. You had a lot of people looking for work online. And then you had a, the third phenomenon, which was a lot of people were creating businesses uh, because they're like, you know, what? I, I lost my job at Lehman Brothers. Yeah, you know, I've got six months before I kind of will take it seriously and get back into the workforce. Why don't I kind of build that 
startup that I was always wanting to build or go help my wife with her her shop. She always wanted to get a website put together. I'll kind of help her with that. Uh, we saw that um, again in the pandemic, three things were happening, you know, people looking for work online, business looking to cut costs, but a lot of startup businesses were happening. And, you know, people were kind of, you know, let's build a little drop shipping um, website where on Facebook, I can sell a particular product that I found off Alibaba or, you know, I can build a game that was very popular, lots of games were being developed and so forth. And we're seeing it again today with, the, with all the layoffs that's happening in tech where, you know, the, the, I think last year there was like 170,000 layoffs in you know, technology companies in the US. And, you know, people are doing the same thing. They're like, you know what, I'm not going to go back working at a, at a big tech company or, or what have you. I'm going to do my own startup. Here's a chance for me to kind of go out there and, and do it myself. And, you know, we're seeing a big boom in, in you know, software development apps. Um, we're seeing a big boom in uh, games and so on. Like what kind of games? Like I, when I think of a game, I think of these really high tech 3D, yep. you know, super games that take a thousand man years to build. Like can someone just go on freelancer.com and say, oh, I could build a game? Like how, how do you? How do you build a game? Absolutely. You, you, you come in and you just kind of write out, write out a brief and you say, this is kind of how I want it to work. And, and there's, there's all sorts of freelancers, all the way from individuals right up to, to professional agencies uh, that will do it for you for, for any budget, really. I mean, there's, there's one that happened, uh, like as, as we speak, they're, they're building a game around war and strategy. Uh, there'll be, you know, there's missions, special events, and an entire campaign storyline. Um, then implementing a play to player feature and a play versus machine model, et cetera. And you can do this stuff very, very, very inexpensively, about one tenth of what it, you know, expect to cost if you went to local agencies. And, um, you know, the talent is incredible today. You know, any skill set you can possibly imagine, you can hire kind of the snap of your fingers by just posting a project and it's there. Basically, the global economy benefits. So you have people in third world countries who are doing this labor cheaply, and you have people like who are laid off from Amazon last week. Uh, they have maybe a little extra cash to hire somebody from some other country through a site like freelancer.com or Upwork or whatever. They can uh, lay out the cash to build a game, build a website, build a, a, a store, whatever. And That's so, right. So who's who actually will, will restaurants all go out of business because there's not going to be any waiters anymore? Well, I mean, there's a, there is there is an issue with restaurants. Why would someone be a waiter? But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pretty amazing phenomenon because what's happening is, um, you know, France is a pretty magical place because, you know, the 66 million people are on the, on the marketplace. Um, they're creating the future and they're creating opportunity and it's really changing lives. So, so on one hand, yeah, you've got the, the guy who left Amazon in, in the US who's like, you know what, I'm going to start a, a game or I'm going to start a, a website or an app or what have you. And so they're kind of creating the future and innovating and, and doing, you know, fun, fun things. Um, and then on the other side, you've got people in emerging markets who are working in highly skilled areas and it's generating opportunity and income and tech jobs and you know, you know, skills are being generated and so forth. Um, and so it's, it's, it's changing lives on the other side of the equation as well because, you know, glo globally there's, you know, a huge disparity in, in things like wages, right? And the average wage in the US last time I checked was about $123 a day and the average wage in India was something like $2.25 a day. So there's like, like a 50 to 1 disparity. And those, those ratios might have changed a little bit, but, but the, point, the point is you can, you can deliver high-paying jobs on one side of the equation um, in, in areas that desperately need them and, and lift skills up and uh, build independence because the freelancers, they're all, you can choose when you want to work, what field you want to work in, how much you want to be paid, uh, and so forth. And at the same time, it's it's really, um, it's architecting the future of, 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 of basically work. It's, you know, create a job rather than take a job. And I think a lot of people, when they went off, you know, you know the stimulus happened and there was a lot of, you know, benefits and, 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 and so forth. You correctly identified that a lot of people didn't go back to the traditional workforce. They're like, you know what, I can, I can run my own business now. I can find ways to start things, uh, yeah, side hustles even to supplement my income. And I get to kind of, you know, be master of my own destiny rather than kind of, you know, clock in, clock out nine to five. And it seems like AI is this huge thing that's only just happened like yesterday that's going to completely change the nature of freelancing even like as, as we were already discussing like what skills are going to be the important skill sets to be a freelancer in the coming months years and so on now that ai has been introduced it seems like you're gonna to have to have really good communication and project management skills like you said people are gonna to have to be conductors of many different skill sets that ai is is you is doing as opposed to necessarily having the skill yourself that's right. I mean, the, the advances are, I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's only since August of last year that I think Stable Diffusion came out, which kind of kicked off the whole uh, arms race. And now you've got things like Midjourney, you've got obviously ChatGPT4, which came out, which is game changing. Uh, any sort of white collar job um, now, the AI will be able to figure out and, and, and probably do at the, at the elite level. And so where the opportunity comes in is A, 
now anyone's super skilled. Anyone can use the tools. Anyone can get in there and, and perform at the elite level across a range of different areas. And yes, the jobs will move up the stack just like they've moved it with every you know, leap of technology. So you will be less sort of programming in you know, Python and you'll be more saying, I would like to have an app that's like Uber for pets. Uh, can you change the features here? Can you, um, you know, more of a product manager, more of a director, more of a conductor. You know, I, 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 the styling, I don't really like the styling. Can you please make the styling a little bit more modern or a bit more sleek or a bit more like that website or generate a mood board for me based upon the following you know, preferences or and what have you. So so it's going to be really lifting productivity levels, both of, of the freelancers that do the work and also the speed at which companies can commercialize products. Because you, you'll literally be able to say, okay, build me a company today and I want a website, I want an app, I want it to work like this, I want it to be in this sort of styling and presto, it's there. Then you've got to have a real challenges of, well, how do I sell it? How do I market it? And so forth. What are you seeing the most in terms of like changes just in the past few months across the freelancer.com community? Oh, definitely in design and copywriting. So, you know, the copywriters now are less writing the copy themselves and they're more being the editor. So ChatGPT, for example, can generate content in any field you, you want. Um, but then you have to tell it, well, actually do it again, but um, do it in a different style or... I showed off an example. There's a friend of mine who runs Macro Voices, the podcast. Eric Townsend, I had lunch with him the other day. And he's like, oh, you know, could you get it to write an interview transcript with me with um, Sergei Glaziev? And I, it wrote the transcript as if the two of them were, were speaking. And he's like, oh, but it doesn't really understand that um, he might have a, a certain bias given his position in the Russian ministry. And so I said, ChatGPT, do it again, noting that he's in the Russian ministry and he might have a bit of bias. And I rewrote the whole transcript. And he's like, wow. Right, so you will play more of an editorial role like a cinematographer or a director or a producer sort of role where where you'll you know, look at it and go, okay, change that, change this, what have you. But the, but the AI itself in terms of what it can generate would be incredible. I mean, like in a few weeks from now, you better say, um, make me the movie Top Gun 17 where um, Putin's fighting that with Tom Cruise and you hit a button and bang, the movie will come out the other side. That's literally weeks away. <laughs> so uh, it's pretty exciting times and the whole industry is going to change. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care 
that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Whenever someone says, well, ChatGPT can do this, but it'll never be able to do that, you know they're wrong. <laughs> like it's whatever you say that's never going to be able to do, eventually it will do it. And so the question is, at what point, I mean, with every change in technology in history, as you said earlier, there's always been more jobs created than lost. Or like when horses were replaced by cars, more jobs were created than were lost in the horse industry. But will there come a, a tipping point where AI finally does the full human experience, the full human job, you know, in, in major industries? Well, yeah, and major, you've got, you've got to remember that most jobs actually are not online jobs. Most jobs are actually physical jobs where you kind of have to go somewhere and, you know, pick something up and, and put it down. And until they've plugged chat GPT into Boston Dynamics Atlas, we've got a bit of time left uh, before Terminator <laughs> sort of takes over. Um, but yeah, certainly, um, I think it'd be interesting when the, when the software starts writing itself, like, you know, ChatGPT gets given the source code to ChatGPT and said, you know, can you improve ChatGPT? Uh, it'd be pretty crazy. I think the other big crazy thing is going to happen is when they feed in every single academic paper, every thesis that's been written but, you know, by a PhD student, every bit of research known to man, and they'll say, okay, based on all of that research, can you write a paper for a pill that will extend human life by five years or, or whatever it may be? I think you'll have a technological explosion that's going to come out the other side of that. And, and you know, that combined with, you know, uh, the feedback loop of the software writing the software, uh, if ChatGPT can kind of write itself, you you might get a pretty crazy sort of times. I mean, they've talked about the singularity for years where, you know, at some point te the technology will outstrip the ability, you know, the, the pace at which technology improves will um, outpace the ability of the human mind to be able to comprehend it. And you'll end up like this big bang sort of phenomena where either man and machine will meld and that's what Elon Musk is trying to do with um, Neural Neuralink, where he's you know tr trying to say, well, maybe the future of humanity is being inside the machine, um, or you might end up with a Terminator event where you know the ChatGPT ends up driving Boston Dynamics Atlas, and then you know the AI figures out that humans are a threat and they're a waste of resources, and you get in, you know you're trying to call for John Connor at that point, um, or it might be the Peter, Peter Mandis model who who runs um, the X Prize Foundation, where he says it's the age yeah. of abundance and everything will be plentiful and you'll be sitting back with your feet up and everything you every whim you want will be 
provided for and you might be in that sort of universal basic income sort of scenario where, you know, we've got that age of plenty, everything's provided for you, you don't have to do anything and everyone kind of just sits around playing World of Warcraft 15 or something or other, which is generated on the fly. And, uh, you know, the I most- mean, if you compare now to like, let's say even, let's say 50 years ago, think about it. Like you can already order food delivered to you. You can have a famous chef cook your food, have it delivered to you, watch on your large screen TV, a hundred million dollar movie that was made by Steven Spielberg and then sleep in your bed, which is monitoring all your vitals while you sleep. Like it, it, it we already live like unbelievable digital, like gods. And what's going to happen next is, is unbelievable. I guess, I guess the main thing that so many people are uncertain about is what will this, uh, could this be, have a negative effect on their lives? Like, well, for instance, if you're a journalist, there's no reason to hire a journalist anymore. You could just say, Hey, chat GPT, there was this incident that happened today. Summarize it for me and let, and put it, run it in the paper. Like, like, unless you're an investigative journalist, well, you're gone. I, well, I was about to, I was about to say that, right? Um, I actually think the quality of journalism has gone downhill a lot because the whole business yes. model has been transformed by Google in that it's just how many you know, clicks and views of a page you've got and how many ad impressions you've got. And as a result of that, um, it's really about, you know, can you write a real clickbait headline that gets people to click on a on a link, right? And the actual journalism has been reduced to 500 words and, and you probably know better than anyone. It's very hard to get more than one idea across in 500 words. And so what's actually been lost is the actual narrative of what actually is happening in the world. I'm on yeah. LinkedIn. I was, I was made one of the hundred influencers at one point, and so I could post, you know, really long stuff that everyone would read. I wouldn't publish every week. I'd publish once a year something that'd be like, you know, eighty-five pages long, and I'd try and actually string together the narrative of actually what's going on. And that actually had remarkable pickup. Like, uh, you know, I had an article that was read by a million people in two days, went far around the world. So I actually think that there is a lost part of journalism, which is more of the long story narrative, the investigative piece and so forth. I think the quality of journalism has dropped dramatically. So I think there's still a place for journalism that chat GPT won't fill. But I think, you know, the run of the mill sort of stuff like, you know, the sports scores and comment on the on the baseball game or, you know, a stock market going up or down or world events or what have you. I think a lot of that can potentially at a very basic level be done by software and and, and, and probably already is in a fairly big way. But I think that there will be a place for yeah, I, you know, I higher level more sophisticated work that the AI won't do. Let's say you're 25 years old and you don't want a traditional job. You want to be a freelancer. What would you say are like the four or five professions where someone even in the U S could make a living, could make a good living as a young person? Well, the three big ones right now, are actually user interface design, um, game development and programming. They're the ones that the top earners for, for freelancing. You know, I think product management is the huge industry that's taking off with, I mean, 15 years ago, the title of the, of the role wasn't even around, but now every tech company in the world is sucking in product managers. And product managers are basically you're a mini CEO of something. So it's a multifaceted jack of all trades sort of profession. And I think, you know, those sort of skills, I mean, the AI is going to take a bit of time, I think, to be able to reach human level of aesthetics and be able to, to decide how products should actually be built properly. I mean, it can, it's very good at looking at all the world's, you know, content on the internet and then going, okay, um, based upon that, I can do something you know, at the top level uh, in any field. But I think, you know, tastes change and human behavior changes. And I also think you, you're going to get a bit of a reflexive thing happening uh, on the internet. The, the big thing I think is going to happen is this whole open world that's been created because of Google and search engine optimization where, you know, everyone you know, produce great content, put it on, your, on the internet for free. Google will index it and then kind of monetize it by displaying ads when you search for stuff. I think that whole model is going to implode. I think all the data sets are going to go private. I think people are going to turn off turn off their logged out um, web pages because Google Google's going, I think in a, in a very much an existential moment right now. There's a finite amount of search traffic in the world, so you and I there's a finite number of things that we actually are interested in searching for every day, right? And a lot of that has now been deviated to ChatGPT or similar, right? Or or will be like I think I think ChatGPT is even though it's the fastest growing app ever, it's still a lot of people don't use it every day, but they will. Oh, the next 12 months will be bigger in terms of change than the launch of the commercial internet in 94, 95. I mean, 94 was the year you, the geeks had email addresses. 95 was the year your grandmother had an email address and everything changed forever. Everyone's selling online. Yeah. The next, next 12 months are going to be just even bigger than that. So I can, so I can guarantee you that Google's going to lose a lot of search volume and the tolerance for people to see 53 ads 
when searching for something. I mean, you go to Google now, it's ridiculous. You say Flowers Sydney and bang, yeah. you've got 53 ads on this page and you've got to keep scrolling down before you see any relevant content. And the content that you do see has all been tweaked to kind of generate Google more money because when Google launches their um, algorithm changes, and they did one just actually a few weeks ago, what they're doing you know, is they're not cutting back on web spam. They're actually A-B testing revenue. So they're rerouting the internet just to make Google more money. So it's all, you know, that's kind of what's happening there. But, but the point is that no one's going to be tolerate that heavily ad-soaked model um, for search. It's, you know, ChatGPT is very clean. There's no ads, right? And so I think what's going to happen is, you know, anything you put publicly on the internet is going to be sucked down by the AI uh, or multiple AIs. Um, and so a lot of these companies that do produce, you know, new data that is important and interesting, what have you, they're going to close that off. They're not going to show it to Google anymore. Google's, the traditional Google search engine is going to be less relevant. Um, and Google's have a real existential crisis because it won't be able to throw so many ads at people. So I, so I, I think it's, because I mean, think about it, you know, you give it two, three, four years from now, you know, if I'm a scientific researcher and I publish a paper, you know, the AI will suck that down in a nanosecond and then potentially commercialize it somehow, right? So uh, people are going to be unwilling to share content online and they're going to keep those data sets private and monetize them in other ways rather than, you know, through... And, you know, and also the, the AI has learned from all the public data that's out there. So like the AI presumably has read every Wikipedia post, has read every Reddit post, has read, you know, most blogs. So, you know, when you ask Google a question... One, one third of those questions, you probably end up on Wikipedia as the answer. So you divert, you know, Google's like a way station to Wikipedia for for about a third of the questions that are asked. So to some extent now, ChatGPT just skips that whole thing and just answers you directly. Yeah, well, I mean, Google does that in a very cunning way. So what they do is um, Wikipedia is shown there as a token bit of organic content to make it look like they're actually showing you relevant information rather than just ads. And because Wikipedia is not yeah, a yeah. not commercial effort, so it's, it, that's why it kind of ranks there all the time. But yeah, I, I, I certainly get your point. But um, yeah, I just think I think all the data sets going to go private. I think I think uh, the whole model is going to change. The Google model is going to change. Search is going to move to more of a chat interface and a voice driven chat interface. You know, the next version of the Siri is going to be pretty crazy, and uh, we'll see where it ends up. How is Freelancer.com going to change uh, as a result of AI? I, th I think it's incredibly beneficial for us because number one. Um, the supply of skilled labor is desperately needed worldwide. That's the whole thesis behind freelancer. And now that that supply of skilled labor is going, going up dramatically, people are increasingly time poor and need people to do things for them. So, you know, I, I, take, I take the example of my mother. Like she needs to get things done all the time, but she's not going to sit down and figure out the journey or what have you. Even if, it get, even if the interface gets really, really nice and easy, she's not going to figure out how to draw an illustration, resize it, put it up on a website, maintain right. it. You know, whatever it's not going to happen. So, so someone's going to have to do all that work, sort of work. And the other thing is, the ability for us to personalize content for you to help you get things done is extreme, right? We've got we've got a whole bunch of AIs being deployed right across the website right now. So, for example, you type your project description, you know, kind of what you, what you want done. Most people don't know what they want done. Most people come and they go, oh, I want to build a website, but they don't know the functionality that they want on that website. They don't know what platform to select. And building a website is how long is a piece of string? It could be a fifty dollars website. Or it could be a $500,000 website. It really depends how complex and, and so forth. But the ability for the AI to help you with that job spec and write the job spec out for you and iterate over that and show you a mood board and do you like that? Do you not like that? And then basically help you find the best freelancer that's specific for that and then structure the, the product development plan, write the technical specification, all that stuff can be done automatically. And so that's on the, on the entrepreneur side. I would imagine also on the freelancer side, look, a lot of people are from countries where English might not be their native language. So even just structuring a proposal, it's going to help them. It's funny you mentioned that. We've got a feature we're pushing that, uh, actually in the next uh, week where the chat interface will magically transcribe your voice and your typing to a different language. And so you can be... Oh, that's you know, really fascinating. You could be, you know, have very poor grasp of English and you can now speak fluently in English uh, by voice and it would just pop out the chat side and vice versa. So that's all, that's all going on live in a week from now. It's all moving so fast, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, all the changes that happen. And I'm still trying to decide whether, well, you know, I think if you're like if you have a brand like Freelancer.com, AI is not going to suddenly make its own brand. Like people, it's not going to become Freelancer.com. Freelancer, Upwork, a few of the winners in the in the freelancing space will continue to be that way. It's not going to recreate Uber. Uber will still be Uber. So in terms of like companies that have already made it through and have become big brands, they've kind of survived the AI apocalypse that might be coming for industries. But 
I wonder what industries will just basically shut down. You know, again, like you, you were mentioning, like basic graphic design, it's not shut down, but it's changed. You can't just like design stationary. You actually have to build the app and design the app now for people. And so, so industries are going to morph and skill sets are going to change, but it's going to be interesting. Well, I had a thought about that. I think the industries that have a creative element to it are, or a human connection to it or um, you know, really higher level critical thinking to it, that, that, you know, everything we've just got the stack. There are some industries though, where I think it's very much rule driven. For example, accounting. If you're an accountant, basically yeah. the government sets the rules and your job as an accountant is to basically not be creative, <laughs> right? You know, is to follow the rules, right? And I think there's professions like that, which I think will just be done in a nanosecond through an app and in real time. And I think those jobs are going to change quite dramatically. I think a lot of legal work's going to change. Um, certainly at one yeah. end, you could be creative and argue in court and this, that, the other, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of legal work is drafting. And right now I can get ChatGPT4 to draft me any document I want. It'll write me a patent. It will write me a non-disclosure agreement, write me a Series 8 stock subscription agreement, uh, and it'll do a pretty good job. I actually sat down with a bunch of lawyers last week in Vancouver, and they said, oh, I bet it can't draft a escrow agreement for a share purchase in the province of British Columbia because there's a few little tips and tricks that you've got to follow, right? And I hit the button. and you see Challenge the, accepted. The guy's face just went, he looked at his partner, he said, just as well, I'm retiring next year. It's your problem now. <laughs> No, it's true. There's already a company set up that will, AI does all the back and forth. If you get like a parking ticket or, you know, a driving ticket, uh, they will handle all the legal work for you just using AI. Yeah. I think there'll be an explosion of lawsuits because it's so simple now to, um, for the AI to, to create a suit and, and file it. And I think there'll be an explosion of defense, you know, apps to defend against these lawsuits. So I, I think legal, I think legal system will be busy, very, very busy because the cost to the cost to enter a suit is usually quite expensive. And now that, that barrier's dropped because the, the AI will do the drafting for you. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm trying... I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything. Although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works travels and or cares about looking and feeling great as you could tell by my many photos across the internet i care about looking fantastic i'm practically a model and let's be honest every guy loves to look great so again shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20 percent when you spend 130 dollars or more using promo code james that's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. 
this is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, Download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. Now, do you think with all this innovation happening and, you know, you take AI and then you take innovations that have already been occurring on in other industries like biotech and so on and, and robotics and every industry, do you think that innovation will be enough to perhaps slow down what's happening? Because, you know, my opinion is it was a shame the global economy shut down for almost two whole years and we still don't know the full ramifications of that. Part of the ramifications is that we went from 3% freelancers to 40% freelancers. Another ramification, other ramifications, we just don't know, like the effect on currencies and so on. So do you think though the pace of innovation will be fast enough to kind of reverse whatever negative effect we have from, from shutting down the economy for a couple of years? Well, I, yeah. Well, I think freelancing is incredibly deflationary. And I think the advances to AI are probably one of the most deflationary things I've seen in, in, in human history. So I think yeah. I think they will certainly have an effect to try and slow some of the inflationary pressures. But I think the Fed is kind of damned if they do, damned if they don't, right? I mean, typically you have to raise the policy rate, I think about 4 or 5% above the real inflation rate in order to kind of you know, stem inflation you know, in, a, in a traditional sort of textbook sense. Uh, and I think, yeah. the real, I think the number's about 6 or 7% roughly in terms of inflation is being reported. The, the real number is probably close to 15%. And, yeah. you know, they, they, raised, they raised rates to 4.75 in the fastest hike, I think, in history, and Silicon Valley Bank blew up, right? And Silicon Valley Bank is, it was doing phenomenally well because it banks all the tech companies, right? It, it, had, it went from $60 billion in deposits to $190 billion in deposits in two years. So it was flush with cash. It just had nothing to, to, to lend to because those deposits are liabilities on the, on the bank's balance sheet. And so they've got to have assets. They've got to loan it out. And uh, they couldn't figure out what, what, what to do with it. So they stuck $82 billion into mortgage-backed securities, an average yield of 1.56% over 10 years, which meant you got your money back in 10 years, no problem, but startups burn cash all the time and it went quarter by quarter and the startups kept on burning and then they kind of had a bit of a liquidity crisis when when the VCs broke ranks and said, pull your money out. So I think all the banks around the US can have that problem. So the Fed, if the Fed keeps raising rates, you're going to blow up a bunch more banks. If you lower rates, you're going to, you, inflation's going to be out of control and the US debt is mathematically unpayable at the current level. So you know, I, and in some way, I think the US government wants a lot of inflation to continue so that the the debt problem becomes smaller and smaller and smaller in, um, you know, once you, you know, and that's why they want to have a policy rate of 2% usually because after 30 years, the, the, the debt problem is half, half as big because you've inflated it away. So I think they kind of want to run inflation hot for a few more years and then, uh, and that's why you've got these policies like, you know, Green New Deal and, you know, you know, reparations for everyone and, um, you know, education, you know, waiver student debt and, and so forth uh, because I think they want to run inflation hot to make the, the, the US debt problem go away and then they'll do some sort of a reset with a central bank digital currency, maybe with some loose backing by gold or whatever, what, what have you, but certainly a pretty dynamic space right now. But yeah, I, I mean, these are very, you know, freelancing, you know, uh, freelancing online and um, the AI and, and software and so forth, very deflationary forces. So we'll, we'll see where it ends up. Well, you know, it's interesting because before they dropped all this money on the economy during the pandemic, they were fighting deflation. Like that was what was keeping the, the Federal Reserve governors up at night was worries about deflation because of technology changes or because of, of freelancing around the world and so on. And they kind of got their wish of inflation, but maybe maybe too much. And hopefully some of it is transitory because supply lines were, were all shut down. But, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see. Um, it's going to be, it's definitely going to be an interesting time. 
I mean, the problem is printing money won't dig any more copper out of the ground any faster, really. Yeah. These things take time. But that's why we got, we got off all the, you know, we got off all the gold standards because we didn't have enough gold to pay, to pay our, our debts. Well, I mean, getting off the gold standard was, was phenomenal for the US in terms of driving economic growth, right? It basically meant you could just print money and, you know, you, you know you, you, you're playing Monopoly and, and you're the banker and you can print your own money. You can buy, buy everything on the board. It's been, it was phenomenal for the US. But now we've got, you know, obviously a few things got de-pegged such as, you know, wages. And now we're getting the ramifications of that because it's, it's gone on for so long. So I think there's going to be some sort of a, there's going to have to be some sort of a reset in the next, you know, five years or so. Do you think oil will get de-pegged? Do you think like, um, you know, with, with China kind of brokering relations with, with Saudi Arabia and Iran and, their, and, and Russia and so on, do you think at some point the petrodollar won't exist? Well, that's the talk of the week, right? Because uh, I think the first transaction for uh, just went through in in, in Rimbibi, uh, last night, and Saudi is now shifting oh, their really? focus. Oh, really? I didn't the, know that. Yeah, it was on, on Twitter I saw, and they're they're now shifting their focus in terms of security alliance uh, alliance to China, along with many other countries in the world. I think a lot of I think one of the mistakes the U.S. did was the sanctions program against Russia because you know. Uh, confiscating, um, you know, oligarchs' boats around the world. I think it freaked out a lot of countries where you've got, you know, a lot of people in power have got a lot of toys around the world parked in the Mediterranean or what have you, and I think that got people greatly concerned. Um, so I think I, I, we'll, we'll see where it ends up, but I think we're obviously heading to a very confrontational um, point in uh, human history. I mean, we've had the, one of the greatest peacetime periods in, uh, you know, in, in modern times, you know, since World War II, really. There's been a few kind of, you know, minor wars around the world, but but I think we're heading to a confrontation. I think they call it a Thucydides trap, where you've got a mon- monopolar world, and then suddenly there's a there's a, a a great threat from a from a usurper, and that was China. And I think I think Trump kind of looked at that and said, okay, well, uh, his advisors told him that uh, I think about thirteen critical technologies that the U.S. has that that China doesn't have. You know, they can they can punch out you know, electronics and make chips and so forth, but they don't can't make the machines that make the chips. You know, and um, you know, certain types of you know uh, superconductors and AI and this, that, the other, and so he was like, okay, well, let's try and start a bit of a trade war here to try and temper the, you know, temper the usurper. But I think now it's kind of been a bit mismanaged, and I think there's too many people turning against the US. So it's it's, it's a pretty pretty scary time. So what what do you worry about in terms of like the next five years? You know, as the you have your pulse on the global economy because you see so much of what's what's going on in the freelancing world. What worries you over the next five years, like you personally? Well, <laughs> it's are we going to go to war first, or will the robots f- figure out we're a waste of space first? <laughs> you know, are we going to go to a Skynet situation first, or are we going to go to, you know, a hot war? Basically, I think they're two the two big risks right now. Yeah, and economically, what are you worried about? Well, I mean, inf- inflation will cause a lot of social unrest. I mean, the thing is, you know, back in the global financial crisis, when they printed money, they printed money in a way. You know, through quantitative easing and so forth, where it, it kind of flew, it kind of flowed into sort of hedge funds and and and, and so forth, right? And so the, the asset prices got inflated. So you know, the you know, stocks went up, and um, you know, everything from you know, fine art to classic cars and watches, all that sort of stuff inflated, right? This time around, when they did the stimulus for COVID, they did it in a way where food prices inflated because they're just you know, broad based sort of stimulus. So, so I think the issue now is that you know. Um, when food goes up too much, people don't eat. And I think someone said that we're only so many hot meals away from revolution. I think you're starting to see in countries like Sri Lanka where the effects of inflation are, uh, you know, it just the country can't ca- take it anymore. And suddenly the president's palace, everyone you know, goes in there and starts going crazy and ripping it down because because people can't eat. And I think that is going to become a broader problem around the world. We have a lot of social unrest if the price of food keeps going up. And, you know, the price of food is linked to the price of oil. It's come down a bit, but that could spike in a, in a, in a variety of different scenarios, particularly with the Saudis kind of uh, uh, pivoting. Um, you, know, you know, if there's a revolution in Saudi Arabia in the next you know, couple of months, it could be a catastrophic um, for the world in terms of the ability to feed each other and, and power things. So, and so now, steel man, that like take the opposite side. What encourages you to to not just lie in bed crying every day, and what what gets you to work? Oh, it's amazing the things you can create now and how easy it is to create it, you know, to turn your dream into reality now. It's just so simple, right? You can come up with a concept. You've got freelancers to help you. You've got AI to help you. You can, it's so cheap. I mean, it used to be, when I started my career in tech, you know, you had to go out and raise a series A venture round of $5 million and, you know, it, was, it took 
18 months, if, you, if you're lucky at all, to get any money together. And, and, and it was just so hard and so slow to sell anything. Now the world is hyper-connected. You have got a great product or service. You know, things can just take off overnight. Right? I mean, like, yeah, look, I mean, look at ChatGPT, right? I mean, that, 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 that is a product. It's the fastest growth of any product in history, right? I mean, right. there's companies around the world you know, that make a billion dollars of revenue in their first year. What's a, a company you've seen literally created on freelancer.com that has gone to like amazing heights that you wouldn't expect? There's one that one of my co parts told me last week. There's a lady in Estonia and she's come up with it. She's got a great uh, product of, of, of bitters, like a range of uh, you know, aromatic drinks. And she came on just to get a logo done. And, and next minute, she's got a website built, whatever. And, and, and uh, we've got a project management service that will just do everything for you. You just pay by the hour uh, $35. And they're running her entire business now. It's doing sales, doing marketing, doing whatever. And she just came in to get a logo done. And she's like, oh, wow, the whole thing's just running itself now. Right. So it's just, that's what's amazing is, is if you've, you know, 60% of people, last time I saw a survey, said they want to be an entrepreneur. 6% of people actually do it. But your ability and ease of doing it now is just so easy. It's incredible. Like just, yeah. And that's what's exciting. The ability to create you know, products and services of the future and, and, and see all the crazy things people are doing and things you'd never think of. And uh, I think that's, that's super exciting. Well, they always say that, you, that between two countries, you either exchange bullets or money. And so hopefully the money will beat out the, the bullets with entrepreneurship and sites like your site, freelancer.com which puts all these things together. And hopefully that's the direction things go in as opposed to a more confrontational one. You know, look, Matt, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really wanted your perspective on the economy, on freelancing, on, you know, what's going on with AI and, and, and the relationship to everything you're doing. And freelancer.com is a great site. I used it to build a business uh, or I used one of the companies you bought early on. I think it was Scriptlance. Back in 2007, I used it to, to build a business that did very well. So I always, I always appreciate what, what you guys do and, and, and the site, and I highly recommend people use it and check it out. And thanks once again. Thanks for having me. I look forward to it. You know, coming in again sometime in the next few, a few years, and we're talking about all the new things that people are doing on the site and what the France are doing. So, Or maybe our AI avatars will come on. It's like uh, my avatar will schedule with your avatar, and they'll just talk. Like they listen to us all day long, so they'll and they, and they train on our words, so they'll just know how to be like AI James and AI Matt, and they'll go on a podcast. Let's do that. That'd be interesting. Pound for pound, scoop for scoop. Nobody does pre-workout like GNC. So forget that junk you can get anywhere else and get to GNC for the best pre-workouts around, like Ghost, Beyond Raw, and Cage. Because if we don't have it, you don't want it. GNC. Make room in your closet because Clear the Rack is on at your Nordstrom Rack store. For a limited time, find incredible deals on Wear Now styles. We're talking the latest trends from your favorite brands, now on sale for even less at Nordstrom Rack. Take an extra 25% off Red Tag clearance throughout the store, including styles from Vince Camuto, Mark Fisher LTD, Stuart Weitzman, and more. All sales final. The best stuff goes fast, so shop this sale at Nordstrom Rack today. Please see nordstromrack.com or ask a store associate for details.